I've been the moderator of the Telecom Digest since roughly 2007. First, first thing up is the door prize. Does anybody know how many stops there are on 53rd Street for the E-Train? How many times the E-Train stops on 53rd Street? Who can tell me that? How many stations? <laughs> well, there's two. <laughs> I found that out the hard way. I got off two feet from the Hudson River and walked all the way to the East River or there's about because it stops twice on 53rd Street. Who uses the subway in New York? This is for whoever needs it. You, sir, you take it. I think there's one ride left on it. Now, Bernie, asked me to do this and I thought I'd give you a, a linear history of the Telecom Digest from one end to the other and highlights from every year and so forth. But you know I started looking through the archives and it occurred to me all the interesting stuff as far as this goes was right at the front when the archive was founded in 1981. The telephone industry was just about to go through the biggest change in its entire history and I've concentrated mostly on that time when people were still new to the internet and still new to ARPANET in fact and there was no such thing as Usenet until PolySci and Telecom became part of the first Usenet groups. The history of the Telecom Digest is parallel to my history. In 1981 I was slogging my way toward the end of my college degree and I was working on the radio board at uh, Franklin Street in Boston uh, I was punching cards on IBM 029s at Northeastern University and learning to program Fortran and dreaming of my bright future as a computing professional. You know, I have a theory. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever sees it coming when it's their ox that's going to get gored. I wish I could say I was an exception to the rule. As I look back, I realized I was present at the end of the, the electromechanical age in the telephone network in North America. Uh, when I started at New England Telephone and Telegraph, we were still using EMX1 and EMX2 signaling units that had been designed for use on telegraphs, literal telegraphs. They had been in service for, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 years without much redesign, and uh, we still used them. We took them up to the T-carrier channel units and uh, used them for private line, and just generally had a great time uh, drawing a wage and uh, working swing shift in Back Bay in Boston. The T carriers were new channel units in the old end carrier bays. That, by the way, is why T carrier has 24 channels in it. And we try to figure out the Wheatstone bridges that uh, we were never trained to use. They were no longer needed for the Varley measurements because the T carriers had freed up so many trunk pairs that nobody ever needed to bother to work on trunks anymore. The changes brought about by digital voice transmission and the computer revolution, they're old news now. Uh, but I witnessed many of them firsthand. Coaxial cables and microwave gave way to fiber. L5 carrier waves to DAX, local test boards to MLT, and toll test to SARTS. And during the same time, the once proud craft workforce where senior technicians took examinations to earn the privilege of wearing a tie at work saw an influx of people whose definition of success was not getting caught smoking a joint on the roof. The craft workforce um, decreased in quality and experience to the point where it became obvious that the job was going to be dumbed down to the point where semi-skilled workers could do it. And I decided to get out and went into other things. I became a computer programmer at 9X, which was uh, what New York Telephone and New England Telephone became after the Bell System breakup. 
And I witnessed the revolution in computer programming too. The methodology and practice uh, um, I saw as a systems analyst, I got promoted a couple of times. Well, they were just constantly pivoting to partake in the latest fad, optimizing compilers and case tools and vendors who promised us the world on a string, but whose primary job skill turned out to be lying through their teeth. In roughly 1994, uh, I saw pretty quickly that the computer programming uh, was going to go away, at least in the United States. Uh, I was asked to put in a work at home arrangement for a girl who was one of the key players on, a, on an important team. And she was going out on pregnancy leave, so I, having been in the craft, was uh, asked to help out. I knew who to call and what equipment we needed. And she sent me uh, an email on, uh, on an old system called Profs that we were still using then and saying, this is great, you know, I'm in my house, it's just like being at work. And I sat there at my desk in, I think it was 125 High Street in Boston, and I said to myself, if they can move this job 10 miles, they can move it 10,000. I knew it was going away, I knew it was gone. Um, as it happened, I was lucky enough to get another position in the engineering department at Verizon. Uh, I'd forgotten whether we were Bell Titanic, I mean Bell Atlantic at that time, and uh, but anyway, I got a job in engineering, and a month before I left the programming groups, we were told that COBOL maintenance was going to a firm in India. So if I do say so myself, I saw it coming. I finished my telephone career in engineering, which is a part of the business where things actually had to work right. <laughs> um, it was uh, a welcome change from the programming groups that had been filled a lot with buzzword babies and other uh, people, well, the less said about them, the better. And I know it's sad. I have a slideshow on it. I'll comment on it um, as we go along, but bef before I start, I'll just paraphrase Jackson Brown. It seems to have gone by in the wink of an eye. Those are my phone numbers. They are real dialable phone numbers. And you wouldn't believe how hard it was to get those. Yeah, sure. Rugrats was the best I could do with 784. The other one, well, that's a Google Voice number, and they just happened off of the 364 exchange code, and I said, that one's for me. Obviously, the email address is my name, billathorn.net. I'm Bill Horn. That's pretty easy to remember. The first moderator of the Digest was Jonathan Solomon, and it started in 1981. He was at Rutgers at the time. Uh, he went for, no, oh, about six years, roughly, and had to do other things for a while. Uh, two guys helped him out, Elliot Moore and Jim Dixon. They were helping out, and I don't know if they ever had official status. Late in uh, 1988, Pat Townsend took over the Digest as the official moderator and uh, Jay Saul uh, went on to other things. Uh, Pat had a stroke in, I think it was 2007, and I was uh, on the phone, you know, wishing him well and stuff, and he asked me to help out while he got back on his feet. I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I guess I can learn how to be a moderator. Um, and I started doing it and just kept doing it. It's funny, though, because I found out later Pat had never worked in the industry. I don't know about Jonathan. Um, he was... Uh, an academician, but I never had any more input about him or his, uh, his background. It was, just wasn't available. I, I think I'm the first guy who actually worked in the phone company to moderate the digest. And many of the readers have told me it's much more technical now. I'm not so sure that's a good thing because it seems to me we're going more and more toward a 
a realm where regulations count for more than technology, but time will tell. Uh, the locations, they're not really very important, but uh, Jonathan started out at Rutgers, and uh, then for a time the I just lived at MIT and was moved to Boston University. Uh, Jonathan made a big point of starting volume seven to celebrate the move. And then in 1988, when Pat took over, he's moved back to MIT. It's pretty much been there ever since. And a sincere thank you, by the way, to the uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, because they give us a free PC, power pipe, and ping. And uh, uh, I will acknowledge also Garrett Wallman, who is the sysadmin there, who just found us a new machine when the old one threw a raid array element and uh, one of the disks in the raid array failed. We were uh, limping along while he uh, got a new machine going for us. So uh, thanks to Garrett. <sighs> Anybody know what ARPANET was? I'm surprised, that was a pretty rare beast. I helped to put in mm, maybe the first lines from MIT to the first ISP in roughly 1979 or there's about You know what bank path addressing is? Well, if you look here on the slide, you can see where the address was a series of bank paths. You had a, an address, UT Zoo, exclamation point, et cetera, et cetera. And it was the major node down in the minor separated by exclamation points, which are called bang, bang uh, elements in the trade. That form of addressing went for uh, all the time when ARPANET was being used. And uh, this is one of the very first uh, messages sent out to the digest, obviously just a test. I want to show you the second post on the digest and then we'll, much later, we'll get to the first one. I think you'll like the reason why. Uh, there's just, you know, some administrative and by asking about alternatives for AT&T and a problem with the dimension. And as uh, Jonathan put out there, Jay Saul at Rutgers was his uh, email. Spinoff from the human nets, which was just the place they put these sorts of things on ARPANET. Um, at the time when we were putting in those lines I mentioned between MIT and uh, BBN, uh, we had uh, all kinds of trouble with them, we equalized them to 50,000 hertz, which is a very, very high quality broadcast equalization. Uh, even FM stations lines were only equalized to 15. These were set up at 50. And specially made paradigm modems that delivered, wait for it, 50,000 bits per second. That was blazingly fast in 1979. Expensively blazingly fast. But here you see uh, J. Saul's first how you doing message? The San Jose Mercury, this was the second post. It was a copy of, uh, somebody sent in a copy of an editorial from the San Jose Mercury. They were pioneers in electronic broadcasting or publishing. Um, but it, it, it felt as if I were writing it myself because I tend to be a curmudgeon about the uh, lack of utility and uh, lack of usefulness of many of the electronic toys people bring to work these days. The guy said, you know, this new dimension system was unnerving and, uh, well, are we the servants or the masters? I have a cell phone, which for practical purposes is uh, an electronic leash held by my employer and uh, I'd just rather turn the thing off and do without it and go back to the old hand crank Ma and Pa Kettle used. I imagine there's others in the same, in the same uh, boat, but uh, I don't know why I think these things have been hyped and uh, publicized to the point where I start to ask just exactly what we got in this trade-off. The guy that wrote the editorial um, talked about a dimension that had a dial tone Morse code where you had to know a certain number of beep combinations and so forth, and uh, long before SMS, of course, but. The, uh, the complaints received, uh, and I can attest to them because I was, as I say, in the business from new features from ESS that required people to adapt to new ways of doing things. 
if you ever try to explain how to flash a telephone hook switch and, and get somebody who understands you on the first try, please tell me how, because I never could. It was uh, just a nightmare to get people to use the 1A, but I suppose we all adapted without quite realizing it. Somebody at Bell Labs didn't think that was a very good editorial. And that was a, a phrase I'd heard before, and as, when I read this and I was preparing this, I said, isn't that the truth? Before we'll have complete adoption of these little gadgets, all the old people will have to die. There's a cheery thought for you. I was surprised to find how many posts there were about modems. Everybody wanted to know how about a modem worked, and there were tips on how to get uh, the maximum performance and so forth. But there was a lot of interest in data transmission on the phone network in the, uh, the early years of the digest. One of the first things the 1A did, and I started in an office which had panel operating in service when I started with it and was converted to 1A ESS. Um, international direct distance dialing was a very big feature of the 1A, one of their big sellers. And uh, although it wasn't advertised, the 800 numbers in use at the time were mostly rerouted into 1A switches because uh, having capability to use SS7, and in some cases still SS6, uh, they obviated the use of blue boxes for 800 number fraud. So all of the 800 numbers were, were rehomed into 1As and um, served from there so that uh, the phone company didn't have to worry about blue boxes anymore. Who remembers Western Union? Has anyone in this room actually ever sent a telegram? Hmm? <laughs> I haven't. I never had the occasion. The funny thing was, in roughly 1976, I was working nights at a driving cab when I was first in school. And we used to deliver telegrams. There was a Model 28 teletype right in the cab office. And we'd pick them up and put them in yellow envelopes and uh, drive them out to where they were supposed to go. The first couple issues of the digest bore news that Western Electric, I'm sorry, Western Union was going to invest in Airphone. And uh, I had uh, maintained the Airphone uh, system and when I was on the radio board. Um, long before I was hired, Twix had been sold to Western Union. There was some sort of court order. But it was always near and dear to my heart because I had been trained to maintain Model 33 teletypes. And uh, if you ever want to get an earful about Model 33s, just buy me a drink and sit me down and I'll tell you everything you wanted to know about them. There were a lot of posts about new features, not only of the uh, 1A, but things as you see here, picture phone, uh, TSPS and tops, the singing clock, etc. cetera. Um, and it wasn't until 1982 that uh, AT&T did sign the consent degree, which ultimately broke up the Bell system in 1984. Um, there was a lot of pushback. A lot of readers started in the denial phase of accepting it and uh, were saying this won't be any different and so forth and so on. But the majority were very interested in what the future would bring and how uh, the new paradigm would change the phone network they knew and loved. There was a lot of mm, information about how to get past the frontline trouble desk or the clerks at the phone company if you had a problem with your modem. Um, that got to be such a severe problem in later years, especially for high price circuits like T1s, that many companies would routinely demand to talk to a third liner on their first call. And they, they'd want the guy's phone number and his home phone number too. And uh, uh, given that T1 lines could bill out at several mm, thousands of dollars a month back when that was serious money, um, they would usually get uh, very good service on those. And surprisingly enough, what I noted was that there were always a, a fair number of questions about basic telephone stuff, the old tip and ring questions, and whether I want to use the red wire or the green wire or the yellow wire in my house, and things of that sort. Some people just couldn't accept it. <laughs> MCI and Sprint were coming in, and 
Um, some of the guys that wrote into the digest were saying, no, oh, this won't happen, this won't change anything, et cetera, et cetera. The general opinion of the regulators was, no, nothing will change, and everybody will be fine, and ignore that man behind the curtain. And uh, that was pretty much what happened. We all know that MCI and Sprint didn't go away, but uh, at the time, the first reaction of many writers, many posters in the digest was obviously hope that it would. One of the big complaints that I was surprised to hear of, I hadn't uh, read before, was that many of the readers were complaining that MCI would, and Sprint representatives would just lie to their face and uh, tell them that things were perfect and perfectly usable when it was obviously not the case. I wondered if that was in contrast to the Bell Systems old policy, the first case of a telecom, relatively major telecom company just lying to people um, just because they could. And uh, we've seen some of the results in customer relations departments ever since. Um, pretty much the old days when you could depend on somebody to tell you the truth when you talk to the phone company are gone and gone forever. There were a lot of questions about REN. Who knows what REN is? Yeah, there you go. I think my line totals up about 10. The FCC specifications for telephones you could buy in the store included a ringer equivalence number. One meant a one standard 500 set Western Electric phone. Um, and if you had a ringer equivalence much above three or four, you uh, had to have special equipment to, do, uh, to deal with it. Uh, most people were, uh, just had the usual two or three phones and uh, worked fine. There was a lot of confusion in the early digests about our J11 and other interconnect kind of standards and how do they get wired and whether you should put the wires on pin whatever. Um, I don't think people were actually wiring our J11 jacks. They just wanted to be reassured that the phone network that they knew and loved wouldn't change all that much. The Notes on Distance Dialing, which was a publication from Bell Labs along about 65 or so, predicted area code exhaust in the classic area code uh, allocation set, those with only one or zero in the second position and never one or zero in the first, uh, predicted exhaust in, I believe, 1987. The statisticians at Bell Labs are pretty good at their job. And there were the first posts about possible exhaust and people predicting it in uh, roughly 1982. So um, I think the new competitors that were allowed into the markets were speeding up what had been an inevitable trend. I'm not sure fax machines were, the, the question is fax machines too, I'm not sure they were such a factor. Um, group two fax was a factor in that it did increase demand for numbers, but by the very nature, you'd never have more than one for a company, you see, and that was never, I think, a, a big draw in the area because what really speeded up area code exhaust was that at the time, new competitors were being allocated 10,000 number blocks. They would get an entire exchange code in each area code, at least one. And of course, if they did business in three or four cities, they'd be getting three or four exchange codes. Uh, it took several years for the companies all to sit down and say, we're killing ourselves here, we better work out a plan. And they went to a system where they would split across thousands of groups for assignments in different companies. But when, when the uh, independent carriers came in and were actually able to compete in the dial tone market, they reached assigned entire exchange codes, which did exhaust the area codes fairly quickly. And as I say, a lot, of, a lot of posts about, well, this isn't going to happen, or people being crabby and complaining about MCI or Sprint and so forth. There's always somebody wants to turn the clock back. And, uh, there's times when I include myself in that group, but we all know that that never works. There was mention, and this surprised me because I've been saying for years that I wanted to have one of these, there was mention of a company that was going to sell an electronic butler. 
which people would have to call twice and, or once to let it ring twice or something, and then they could call back because now the machine was armed and it would actually let the ringing through to your phone. And uh, um, somebody else wrote in saying, well, you can't do that. First of all, they're, it's illegal because you're defrauding the phone company of revenue by using their signaling system without fee. And uh, secondly, at that time, one of the big features of SS7, which the network was ra rapidly being converted to, was that it, it divorced audible ringing, the one a caller hears, from physical ringing, which is the one the called party hears. Um, that was done deliberately to avoid exactly this kind of scheme where you would count the rings and three means I landed okay, and et cetera, et cetera, so that uh, people couldn't use dialing and ringing codes to avoid long distance charges. As, a, as you can see here, the second phase of the adjustment to the new paradigm was a lot of people got mad and started sending in flames and other troll bait that uh, said AT&T was doing them wrong and so forth and so on. Again, I don't think it was serious, just people felt out of balance and uncertain about how much uh, the companies were changing and how quickly. This one surprised me. This was in February of 82. I noticed about a new phone system called Cellular and the FCC's decision to allow uh, serious uh, investments in the new cellular system. I hadn't realized it had uh, gone back that fast or that far. The first cell phones that were available in the Boston area came about roughly in the 1992-3 or so range. Four hundred and eighty bucks for a twelve hundred baud modem. Twelve hundred baud was pretty hot stuff in nineteen eighty two. And this guy was saying, Is this real? <laughs> Can I really pay only four hundred and eighty bucks for a twelve hundred baud modem? As it happened, I was in school in nineteen eighty two. I happened to have a twelve hundred baud modem, a genuine Western Electric two twelve A which had fallen off the back of a telephone truck. <laughs> well, I, I had a reason to have it. As I said, I was in school and uh, uh, we were still using punch cards, believe it or not. I have a stack of them in a drawer someplace that I found just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, at the end of each quarter at Northeastern University, the punch room would be totally busy. The line would be around the block. And I told my professor, hey, I'm holding on a full-time job and doing this other stuff. Give me some help here. And he gave me an account on the dial-in system, which it turned out would take a 1200 baud uh, modem. Um, so I managed to obtain one. It made quite a difference. It was uh, uh, saving me a, a world worth of time, you know, waiting for those key punch machines. Anybody who's ever dealt with a key punch machine knows <laughs> those ancient behemoths were, were, had 10,000 pound test keys. You could pound on them with a sledgehammer and they wouldn't be bothered. And I speak as a guy who learned to type on a Model 19. <laughs> Yep, some things don't ever change. Crank callers. Uh, and there was something, as you see, about San Francisco and how this new device could read or reread or delete messages sent to it through some electronic connection. That's probably the forerunner of the digital pager, but again, I was very surprised that it had happened that early. and. Uh, uh, just as an aside, see if you like this one. I was uh, living with uh, my brother-in-law, and uh, he came home. He was just out of Worcester Polytech in 1983, as I recall. And he came home one day with a big old Motorola brick pager on his belt, the ones that had the tuned reeds in them and the batteries that would last three or four hours or whatever. And uh, I said to him, you must be an important person. you got a pager now. Don't ever forget this, because it's true, as true now as when he said it. He looked at me and he said, Bill, the important people do the paging. <laughs> Telegrams, as I say, they were gone. They were just uh, fading away. And there was a story in March of 82 about 
a guy who wound up in the London airport and had a flight delayed and wanted to send a telegram, but they told him point blank, it'll be two or three days before it gets delivered, but if you send telegram, send flowers by telegram, it'll be delivered today, so you, you can bribe them and pay extra. And uh, because the flowers might spoil, they'll deliver it today. Uh, it was a shame. Uh, telegrams were an essential part of uh, our economy, and uh, I never thought many businessmen used them at all well after fax machines became available. Say la vie. One of the first things that came about in the data revolution was that savvy system administrators and computer planners would uh, rent what were called burglar alarm circuits. It's just a dry pair. It's a, a tip and ring from one place to another. And they were supposedly used for DC signaling. At the time, the phone company still sold circuits for burglar alarm use. And they would attach line drivers to them made by various companies and, and use them as digital circuits so that they could get uh, a lot higher rates than even uh, at the time the premier, premier standard for data transmission was the T1 line, which was, um, depending on how it was arranged and used, either 1.544 or 1.536 megabits per second. But you could get up to 10 or even 15 if you had a short haul and just a couple of burglar alarm circuits between two buildings. It's not the proudest part of my life. Um, we made it our business to frustrate those who tried to do that. The attitude among the craft workforce was if they wanted high-speed data, they should damn well pay for it. And one of my favorite tricks was to repair burglar alarm circuits by finding two defective pairs one with the tip open, one with the ring open, and so forth, and connect the burglar alarm circuit to those. There was no specification for audio quality, of course. It was a DC line. And all it needed to be able to do was close the burglar alarm relay. But of course, the people that were using it for other things would call in and complain tremendously about noise, and we'd tell them, well, sounds like you want an audio line. Go talk to sales. And uh, as I say, not the proudest phase of my life, but then again, uh, when you're on the swing shift at Back Bay and making really good money and you even have a car, I mean, you know, that was, that was high living for a Vietnam vet in his 20s. And uh, I look back and I say, well, I understand why I did it, but I guess I really did drink the Kool-Aid on that one. <laughs> Lease lines, and there were a lot of them at the time when the digest first started out, the, roughly the 1980 to 85 time period, it was very common for companies with PBXs to connect them with leased lines to avoid dialing expense. Um, most PBXs were provided by the phone company at the time, and they were manufactured and installed so that it was impossible to use them as tandem offices. If you were in Boston and you wanted to call Framingham, you'd pay for a toll call to Framingham, even if you had a PBX in Framingham and a leased line between your PBX and Framingham. They wouldn't let you jump across uh, a tie line to get out into Framingham and uh, complete a call that way. You had to pay the toll cost into Framingham. And since good old Ma Bell supplied all the PBXs, well, businessmen had fewer few choices. It wasn't until there was substantial competition in the PBX market and all the competitors offered tandem dial-out service and walked watts, watts boxes and things of that sort that uh, Ma Bell learned to loosen up a little bit. There were a lot of problems with uh, linemen and, and the old tip and ring guys, they click a, but, a Budinsky set on a pair, the lineman's handset, of course. And if they didn't hear anything, they didn't get dialed on, they'd say, well, this is spare. We'll, we'll use this one. Got a bad pair. I need a pair. We'll use this one. And of course, they were stealing it from some audio circuit or some data circuit or whatever. The special service crews who uh, had to go out and fix what the lineman left behind <laughs> started putting resistors on them so that. Uh, the local test board, when it looked at him, would see a resistor out at the subscriber location called a sub in the trade and, uh, and wouldn't try to steal the pair. Even in 1982, there were devices available to allow what are now called nanny cams except there was no camera, you could just listen in, but I assume people would call home and trip this device that I wrote about here and see if there was a vacuum cleaner going or a party going. 
uh, go from there. Um, the funny thing was that, that um, it turned out that the device this company was selling was a version of a black box. It would trip ringing but not uh, supervise the line. So people could call home and listen to the nanny without actually paying for the call. And needless to say, that wasn't uh, uh, a successful paradigm. There, was a, there were many follow-ups. People talked about wiretapping, and there were a lot. There was an entire thread that ran for a better part of a month about some kind of indicator to show whether your line was being tapped. And basically, at some point, cooler heads prevailed and said, "You can't. It's utterly impossible. Don't even pay the money for these things." The first point is that. Yeah, under $500 modems for 1,200, and uh, we'll put up a 300 baud until then. Yes, these were real people who really thought that having a 1,200 baud modem for less than 500 bucks would be a great advance. At the time, they were right. And as you can see, my feelings about VI, um, well, I used the one truer editor. I don't know. What do you think? Could it have been the clunk system? If his name had been Alexander Graham Clunk, we would have had the clunk system. Mm -hmm. And if his name had been Siren, would phones ring or would they wail? <laughs> well, that's a pass for humor in 1982. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. I know. He eliminated all the jobs in broadcasting. His, his people at the FCC made uh, my expertise and that of a lot of other guys useless. Uh, I don't know who Frankston at Frankston.softars was, but. Say again? Ah. Uh. Well, he didn't like that the fact that the phone company wasn't being as responsive as you can see. <laughs> this struck me as funny. There was a there was a thread on the Minitel system that was being installed at the time in France, and a lot of people uh, questioning whether they could get it to work on regular telephone lines. The Minitel system was a character-based uh, uh, replacement for information operators. And uh, uh, France made it work, made it successfully work. And uh, as you see here, it was recently retired. There were a lot of the farmers that used it during those, what, 30 years? It didn't want to do without it anymore. They just were content with the, uh, the character-based terminals and being able to get phone numbers and what, what, they, what they were used to. <laughs> Phil Karn, who was one of the savviest guys ever, in uh, cellular design, uh, was also a ham operator, still is, and designed a software package that would allow ham operators to hook up their radios and do TCP IP. In effect, each ham station became a um, router on a packet radio network. Uh, the internet had nothing to fear. The hams uh, just because of technical reasons, are pretty much limited to 1,200 baud, and uh, if you wanted to go higher, you had to modify your radio. And I once spent, uh, right around 1993, I once spent the better part of a year, you know, in my spare time, trying to find paths, microwave paths, between various ham stations to get faster data transport rates. It didn't work out. I, I found out the hard way. New England has all kinds of hills. And everybody who owned the top of one wanted to be paid. The elimination of the Morse code was a hot topic in ham radio. And um, I think it was good that the debate sort of died out, at least on the telecom digest, because on the ham radio uh, news groups and so forth, it continued for years. Uh, 
I, as it turns out, I'm what is called an old law extra, and I passed the, the same code test as a commercial operator would, and having climbed the mountaintop, I'm entitled to say that the view was not worth the climb. The uh, <laughs> Morris Code is, it's gone for a reason, and good riddance to it. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been in the panel office that was in service, you know what I mean when I talk about the ordure of burnt burl cream. Because Rube Goldberg found a home in a panel office. They were these incredibly long stretches of rotating uh, motor-driven uh, clutches and uh, drive shafts and clutches which would raise rods under electric command and so forth and so on. It was, um, it was a mechanical engineer's uh, either his best home or his worst wet dream, I'm not sure which. But uh, I started out in an office that had panel and uh, uh, you never forget that panel office smell. There was some debate about where the last panel office was going to be or what was at the time, but it was already on the way out. The funny thing was, after we cut the panel office, for a better part of a year, you'd be going by and one of the rods would just start to raise on its own, as if there was still somebody out there with a, with a phone connected to a panel office desperately trying to get through. And uh, we never did quite figure out why, but every so often you'd get a ghost call in the old panel office until they finally did just pull the fuses and turn the motors off. It all went for scrap, but um, quite frankly, I saw some of the old switchmen crying. It was, uh, they'd given their life to that machine. You'd be amazed how attached they had gotten to it. Charles Luff was interviewed in an old switchman, and as you see, it was sort of a steam engine. Uh, they have panel offices in museums here and there. And if you ever do get a chance to see one at work, I recommend that it. it's uh, unforgettable. I don't choose to comment on the dress code. <laughs> Poodle skirts or whatever they call them, and starched white blouses were the norm. And uh, because they had to keep the panel offices so hot, um, they would bring in ice and uh, swamp coolers, basically, to try to cool down the operators. There was really a magneto office in Bryan Pont, Maine. If you wanted the operator, you had to turn the crank on the phone. And the residents were told, great news, we're gonna give you dial phones and you're gonna be joining the 20th century. And a lot of people in town said, no, we don't wanna. They didn't get to stop it, it did come about. But I can understand how they felt. They figured the old system worked fine. And there was always an unwritten contract in those small systems which sociologists have written about, better minds than mine, frankly, about how the operator was expected to be not only a switcher, not only someone who completed the call to a desired number, but also a local information store. She had a call from Mr. Jones to Mrs. Jones. He might be told, well, she's not at home. She's over at the hairdressers. I'll ring there for you. And uh, people could be found and get along quite a bit uh, more easily because the operator knew who everybody was and where they were you know, most times of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the story goes, and it's, it's one of those stories which has to be true, even if it's apocryphal, that the guy who invented the first step-by-step -step switch, the Stroger uh, switch, was a mortician named Stroger, who was mad that the operator in town, who was married to his competitor, was giving his business to his competition. <laughs> so he decided to invent an automatic telephone switch. And... Uh, if it isn't true, it should be, but uh, that's where the automatic telephone switch came about. Stiff competition. 
Oh, come on, I couldn't resist. <laughs> the ASCII Twist Network. Somebody had written in, there was something about a MASH program where uh, one of the actors said, I've got a Twix for you, and somebody was criticizing that as being an anachronism. And uh, someone else sent in, no, it's not true. Twix was invented in 1931, which surprised even me because I had been so involved with the teletype uh, uh, operations. Uh, although, as I say, Twix had been sold to Western Union before I was hired at uh, Mother Bell. Uh, there was a 60-speed Twix network using the old Model 15 and 19 machines. Way back when, it had manual operating cord boards, and the operators, of course, had teletype machines of their own. They would uh, uh, address requests for numbers or connections or whatever by using a teletype. And uh, it was one of the um, odd things how and my career in Ma Bell spans so many different groups that I picked up pieces of knowledge here and there. One of the pioneering studies in, in uh, how to prevent hearing loss among telephone personnel revealed that Twix operators didn't suffer from the same degree of hearing loss as their voice counterparts. And it turned out that the uh, uh, operators who wore the headsets were having a lot more problems because, first of all, they were getting differentially imbalanced hearing having had the headset on for, oh, 12 years, I suffer from that myself, which tends to, dis to deprive them of stereoscopic hearing and, and introduces a lot of errors in what they hear. But the Twix operators, although in a noisy environment, so to speak, didn't have that problem, and they were able to make some very good changes in the, not only in the designs of the headsets, but in the uh, addition of uh, click prevention circuits to uh, uh, stop the old headsets from uh, lessening the hearing of the operators. As I say, I learned to type on a Model 19, and uh, those things were indestructible. They really were. The Twix network was, it was okay, but then the Model 33, excuse me while I digress, got a bad reputation because DEC put them on all of their VACs and other small uh, computer systems they sold to schools. The 33 was available, it was cheap, but it wasn't designed for what they were using it for. It was only designed to be a Twix machine. So it got a bad reputation. I never thought it deserved. The first commands for the Hayes modem. I almost titled this ATS0V1, but I didn't know how many of you would get the joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, the rest is history. The greatest changes in the phone network were at the end of the electromechanical age, and that's when, as I say, the stuff that uh, we had all used for so long. Uh, they had coaxial cables on the center ships of the interstates, and uh, some of them still there. They've just been abandoned in place, but they were the uh, head ends. The head ends for those cables, the L5 centers, strangely enough, were all located near major military bases, and the coaxial cables were buried at a depth which was adequate to prevent uh, electronic spiking, what would be called uh, uh, electromagnetic pulse now, and uh, so that the military, if nobody else, could still enjoy uh, communications. I knew an installer who complained at great length about how when he was installing new equipment in one of those centers, he had to take each frame down individually through the uh, air vent, which was literally shaped like a like a, a civil defense warning sign, and that, that, that was a symbol of an air vent that you could close. And uh, he had to take stuff down, and, you know, none of the veins lined up, so he had to go down, and they'd have to move the thing, and then he'd have to go down another one, and so forth and so on. They were, uh, they were quite labor intensive. But the, uh, the class of cables were gone. They were replaced by fiber, needless to say. And, uh, well, I don't think much has changed since then. Electronics became digital. Um, there were some early transistor drives designed which gave way to integrated circuits, who cares? The biggest change was right there, right at the start when I was in the thick of it. Telegraph signaling and private lines gave way to shared arrangements and now it's unthinkable for a guy with a PBX to uh, pay for a tie line, he wouldn't do it. He'll just 
have either a VoIP line on the internet if he has the traffic to justify it, or he'll suffer the message units and uh, not pay for the tie lines. And last but not least, I thought I would show you the first official post of the Telecom Digest. Where a guy complained about the high cost of AT&T service. In 1981. Well, I don't blame him. Um, of course, AT&T was morphed into what used to be Southwestern Bell. But uh, now and then I think, yep, yeah, there's, a, there's a whole story there too. I could write several books about the high cost of AT&T services and the ways people tried to get around them. And uh, I sympathize with the guy, I really do. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Hope I haven't bored you to tears and provided more light than heat. But the, uh, the Telecom Digest remains um, the oldest continuously published e-zine on the internet. And feel free to come on by comp.decom.telecom and uh, take a look and uh, contribute what you will. Appreciate it.